Assalamualaikum. In today's class, we are going to talk about postcolonial theory. Postcolonialism. Colonialism. Colonialism is a process of settlement by Europeans in Asian, African, South American, Canadian, and Australian spaces. Colonization was the violent appropriation on and sustained exploitation of the native races and space by European cultures. By the 18th and 19th centuries, Britain had colonized many countries. British colonial rule depended on seeing the native population of these colonized countries as inferior and needing the advanced civilization offered by Western culture. This is a map of the British Empire. As you can see, it's expanded um, to many parts of the world, uh, starting from Canada and um, to the middle, through the middle part of the world, um, that is characterized by Africa, and then to Australia. Okay. Malaysia is also colonized by the British. The reason for British colonialism. One of the many reasons for colonization was the spread of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. Colonists offered sources of raw materials, cheap labor, and market for finished goods. But colonialism could not be confined to the economic realm. In order to maintain colonialism, the British needed to show the native population that power and prosperity, uh, their power and prosperity over them. Yeah? So. Uh, the British needed not only to exploit the um, colonized people, but to show that their exploitation is justified uh, by their power and superiority in terms of civilization and religion. How do they do this? It also exported its own legal and religious institutions, multi political, aesthetics, ideas, along with its economic regime. In places like Africa, India, and Malaysia, British colonial rule meant teaching the native population that uh, the, the Western practices are more superior than the, uh, those by those of the natives. British law, Christiani Christianity, British history, and English language and education at missionary schools. These are elements of um, British superiority according to the British. And this is a con... Uh, one of the examples of um, colonization in terms of education are the establishments of um, places like convents and uh, also missionary schools. Okay, thank you. Among others, the export of British Western culture to colonized countries was in the form of music and art so that regardless of the cultures of the Arabs, the Chinese and the Malays, Chaucer, Chaucer, Shakespeare and Milton became the greatest artists who had ever lived. Who, so who is more well known? Okay, I think you can answer this in our class. That is what an English department was originally designed to do to study and assert the mastery of English literature as the most important literature of the most important advanced civilization ever known to mankind. English departments also serve as a mechanism for teaching and upholding the correct form of English by making sure that all people around the world wrote in the same grammatically acceptable form. Postcolonialism in general is a set of critical approaches, ideas, and critical methodologies that enable us to read colonial uh, slash colonizing practices. It invokes ideas of social justice, emancipation, and democracy in the face of oppressive structures of racism, discrimination, and exploitation. The prefix post in postcolonialism hence does not mean that it happens after all forms of colonialism have ended, but all only means that after the political form of colonization has ended. For most British colonies, postcoloniality, the time period associated with postcolonialism, begins in the mid to late 20th century when most of the British colonies, such as India, fought for and won their independence from the British Empire. Postcolonial theory is a complex analytical strategy that foregrounds racial differences in their relationship, political, social, economic, and culture between first slash Western and third slash Eastern world. So first and Western are the same um, term, okay, as well as third and Eastern are the same. So it is a wide reading practice that is political when it examines first 
how the first or west world represented the non-European native world, how colonial histories, anthropology, and cartography uh, were rooted in a racial discourse, how the native world feminized, humanized, and marginalized in both representations and real life in the colonial period, the psychological effects of colonialism on the colonizers and the colonized, the instruments of colonial domination in the literature, art, and architecture, the rise of the historic discourse, and resisted colonialism. Postcolonial theory in literature. Postcolonial theory questions the politics behind the study of English literature and culture from those who were colonized by it. Postcolonial theory asks if it's necessary that the English department reinforce the spirit and power of Western cultural practices which have subordinated the third world. Postcolonial theory is concerned with examining the ways through which the colonizing powers persuaded the colonized people to accept Western cultures as best than. Um, as better than the cultures of the colonized people. One of the most important ways is through the concept of race and racial mind the opposition of white and other. White and versus others. In white versus others versus others binary, the other the in black, yellow, brown, red, or whatever skin color become the signifier for of the otherness of the colonized people. Postcolonial theorists are interested to study how binary opposition based on race such as white versus others are made and enforced by society. When you think about how you know what race someone belongs to, usually you would think about the biological traits that supposedly marks race, such as hair color, eye color, skin color. These biological traits are then attached to certain ideological signifiers, ideas or concepts that we have in our minds on certain things. Examples of ideas that may, we may have of people, we will discuss this later in class. Race as a signifying system. As any signifying system, uh, this connection between the signifier and signifier is arbitrary. The connection between both signifier and signifier cannot be justified scientifically. And this is a poem um, that challenges the idea of racism and the binary oppositions. I'm just going to read this poem. And you calling me colored? When I brown, I black. When I grow up, I black. When I go in sun, I black. When I scared, I black. When I sick, I black. And when I die, I still black. And you white people, when you born, you pink. When you grow up, you white. And when you go in sun, you red. When you cold, you blue. When you scared, you yellow. When you sick, you green. And when you die, you grey. Are you calling me colored? So this is a, a book by Adrid Said who is the theorist of um, Orientalism. Adult Science Orientalism, which was published in 1978, started the field of postcolonial studies as a discipline and postcolonial theory as a critical method. The book offers a fundamental study on how signifiers get connected to signifiers through discursive means, which is through speech and writing, to create the signifying system we call race. Science argues that this course, this speech and writing on certain topic, works to create knowledge about a supposed racial group. The best example is anthropology, a discipline to create knowledge through discourse, spoken or written language about a topic from the perspective of the dominant, usually Western culture, about the subordinated or colonized culture. This knowledge produces power because the superior Western culture could define and describe the subordinated colonized culture as being inferior to their own. Said uses the word Orientalism to refer to this, the set of discourse written or spoken that Western Anglo-European cultures used to produce and hence control a region of the globe known as the Orient. The Orient covers the Arab world, Asia, China and Japan. So this is a European painting of an oriental house. It was painted by Delacroix. This otherness exists in relation to the familiarity of the Western Anglo-European world. The basis of orientalism, racism, is the idea that we ourselves who are civilized and that others are uncivilized or savage. Said works outlines how the cultural knowledge about and representations of the Orientals and the Orient as a place of otherness. For example, we might hear the word oriental and think opium smoking, hidden, mysterious, exotic, all things which are negative and compared to the binary opposites which are rational, civilized, scientific and common. 
Said argues that the Western construction of the Orient projects all the things that the West considers inferior, all the things on the right-hand side of the slash binary opposition on the uh, Orient. So the Orient becomes a place where body, as opposed to mind, evil, as opposed to good, and feminine, as opposed to the masculine, reside. By placing all these forms of otherness on the Orient, Said says the Occident can construct itself as positive. Another example on how the Occident or Westerners project themselves as important to Orientals is through cartography or mapping. Cartography and Orientalism It is a product of how Anglo-European explorers drew the map of the world from the 17th century onwards. Said points out that maps are not just representations of the real world that is out there, a way to locate rivers and mountains. Rather, maps are texts which carry with them a cultural perspective. And you can see this, this, is, a, this is the unconventional map. Okay? And there's many things that you can think about regarding this map. And I will elaborate on this in our class. In this example, England is the center of the world. The map here where space begins, begins the starting point for all other mappings of the world. This is because English people drew the maps and also because England was a major colonial power. Said also argues that the creation of discourse, speech and writings about the colonized culture and about the other works also to silence that colonized culture which cannot talk back to write about itself simply because they do not write or speak in English. Postcolonial literature. An important project of postcolonial literary study is to analyze what happens when the formerly colonized culture starts to or insists on producing its own discourse, including literature about itself. What happens when the empire writes back? To the dominant culture when the colonized insists on becoming the producers of knowledge. The result is this construction of colonialism. The Empire Writes Back. The Empire Writes Back is a famous book by Bill Ashcroft and Helen Tiffin, which showcases post colonial literature from writers living in the post colonial countries across the world. Oh, across the world, yeah. Post colonial writings seek to deconstruct the binary opposition of West versus East. Occident versus Orient, civilized versus native, self versus other, educated versus net ignorant, and etc. As a result, the binary opposition is destroyed. The binary opposition is of East versus West, and others as well. And Homi K. Baba is the post colonial uh, theorist that wrote much on the post colonial um, response to colonialism. He is a professor of English. He was the professor of English and American literature and language and the director of the Humanities Center at Harvard University. He is one of the most important figures in contemporary uh, postcolonial studies and has coined a number of the fields neologism and key concepts such as hybridity, mimicry, and ambivalence. Baba defines the post-colonial identities as shifting hybrid constructions. He criticizes the presumed dichotomies between center and periphery, colonized and colonizer, self and other, following from this construction arguments that self, these are false binaries. He proposes instead a derogate model of nationalities, ethnicities and identities characterized by what he calls hybridity, that is so, there are something they are something new emerging from the third space to interrogate the givens of the past. Colonialism, he stresses, is not a one-way street in, because it involves an interaction between colonizers and the colonized, and the colonizer is much affected by colonialism as the colonized. Uh, for example, in today's Europe, we have reverse colonization. Another example, the old distinction between the industrialized and developing, does not hold true today because so many industrialized jobs have been moved from countries such as the United States to countries like India and the Philippines. Postcolonial critics accordingly study diasporic texts outside usual Western genres, such as those by immigrants and refugees. Postcolonial literature, such as writings by Chinua, Ashabe, and Salman Rushdie, are also studied alongside European responses to colonialism by writers such as George Orwell and Joseph Conrad. One of the most important figures in postcolonial feminism is Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who examines the effects of postcolonial independence upon subaltern women in the Third World. Spivak's subaltern studies reveal how female subjects are silenced by the dialogue between the male dominated West and the male dominated East, offering little hope for the subaltern women's voice to rise up amidst the global institutions that oppress her. Uh, this is uh, one of the you know, one of the ideas about uh, oriental women that they wear veil, veil and they are 
are being oppressed by men. So another work that we will go to in our class is on The White Man's Burden by Rudyard Kipling and it shows how uh, Rudyard Kipling as a member of the civilized um, the so-called civilized uh, colonized uh, colonizers civilized colonizers um, thought about the uh, colonized limitations of post-colonial criticism first it highlights individualist resistance there is also a valorization of individual resistance as in the writings of Gayatri, Chokhagoti, Spivak, Homi Baba and Trimenha and others they are unconnected with institutions or cultures okay so this is one of the limitations of post-colonialism like other theories it has its own limitations and uh, there are people who criticize it uh, the second point is that it ignores contextual differences. No attention is paid by post-colonial critics to contextual differences between the different post-colonial cultures. Issues connected to the different religions and cultures of the post-colonial peoples are often marginalized in favor of discussing the effects of colonialism and neocolonialism on them. Wrongly attributing Islamic resurgence to post-colonial condition. The resurgence of Islamic teachings in post-colonial countries should not be linked to the post-colonial condition as Islam is for all mankind and for all times. Often, post-colonial scholarship identifies Islam in post-colonial literature as simply a form of oppression or as a vehicle of political manipulation. And thus, it does not differentiate between the, between the Islam at within Islam as a religion and the Muslim cultural practices which can be un-Islamic, such as uh, one that you can find in Khalid Hosseini's The Kite Runner or Nawal Esadawi's Women at Point Zero. You know? uh, women, when people read Nawal Esadawi's Women at Point Zero, they would say that these are Islamic practices, but they are not. They are mainly um, the Arabs' personal practices. Uh, or even the Afghanistan's personal practices in the kite runner. Huh? So often, uh, culture and religion are mixed together. Huh? And this can distort the way Islam is represented uh, in many works of literature. Islam outside the fundamentalist or extremist expression has often been absent from critical assets on post-colonial literature. So little do people discuss other than the idea of terrorism about uh, Islam's other aspects, okay, such as the importance of humility, the importance of uh, peace in uh, Islamic thought. You know? These subjects are rarely discussed by uh, those who write on um, literature uh, from Islamic perspective or about Islam, literature on Islam and Muslims. The fourth point is that it downplays the importance of colonial texts. Uh, uh, a shortcoming in post-colonialism is that it downplays uh, the importance of colonial texts. An overemphasis in post-colonial theory sometimes downplays the importance of, readings, of reading the English classics and also can coerce students into politically correct view. An example of this is Anthony Berger's The Malayan Trilogy and how it depicts Malay nobilities. Yeah? Um, in the Malay trilogy, um, and many things that are uh, criticized by uh, Malaysians. Uh, Malaysians thought that uh, the figure of the Sultan, for example, who who drank alcohol was um, untrue, was false, and then, um, but these things are proven to be true. You know, and in, in, in those times, they are. Um, certain incidences that show uh, the Sultan as thinking. Yeah? So uh, when we criticize about uh, colonial works, we need to, um, to pay attention to that, to the fact that these works are, are produced during the colonial period and the period in which we are living now would be slightly different okay, from um, the past, those of the past. Huh? So this is the reference. Okay. So thank you, that's the end of our talk on post-colonial theory.